Welcome to Book Club with Jeffrey Sachs, and today I'm absolutely thrilled and delighted to have Kim Stanley Robinson, the, the legendary, uh, world-renowned and wonderful writer, especially science fiction writer, to uh, have a fantastic discussion. Stan, this is a show that has featured uh, many of the world's uh, leading historians, uh, and but you're the first historian of the future that I've had on, and, and I think I think it is the right way to describe your work. You are writing the history of the next two centuries, uh, I think very accurately, I might say, and I was taken with the, the book uh, cover blurb on the ministry for the future, which we'll start off with. Uh, another uh, leading author, Jonathan Latham, is quoted as saying, the best science fiction, nonfiction novel I've ever read. Uh, and uh, when I read this novel uh, and enjoyed it enormously, I said, this man has sat through a lot of UN meetings because I thought <laughs> the book was so uh, apt at describing uh, the year after year UN deliberations about this critical subject of climate change. Uh, when I asked you when we first had a chance to chat about all those UN meetings uh, that you must have sat through, you said, no, I never went to one. So amazing. Anyway, all uh, hats off to you for that. But uh, this is a, the, the best novel of the future of UN negotiations that I ever read. And uh, by the way, for anyone listening, if, if that sounds a little strange, it's an absolute uh, joy to read. So I just want to be very clear about that as well. It's a fantastic, <laughs> yes, it, fantastic it, book. But how it, could you write a book like this uh, so uh, sharp and uh, I thought so accurate about how things work and don't work. Um, but uh, only uh, learning about the UN uh, after the fact, I think, uh, or going to UN meetings after the fact. Well, uh, they must resemble other... Um, I've sat in on academic meetings, a lot of conferences, scientific conferences for sure. And so it's a kind of... Um, uh, uh, combination of the two. I, I was imagining the UN to be a, a, a kind of a, a space where conferences like the scientific conferences that I have been to, like the AGU meeting or the ACS, American Chemical Society, uh, my wife's uh, society, the Society for Environmental Toxicologists and Chemists, CTAC, I've been to a wow. lot of CTAC <laughs> meetings. Um, and then academia, I, although I've not been an academic my whole, uh, for many decades, I began as an um, instructor of uh, freshman composition in the University of California system when I was young and got my PhD. That that re requires a fair bit of meanings. I don't think they were that different. Although, having said that, when I did see the UN meetings, specifically COP26 in Glasgow, I wished like anything that I had had that experience before I wrote ministry. It would have been a little sharper on details. And there was something... Um, unpredictably strange about the COP meetings. Um, I, I, the, the people who invited me were the UK hosts, uh, Nigel Topping, the UK government, and they gave me a red pass so I could go right into the negotiation um, sessions yeah. rather than being in the blue zone where it's a trade zone or the green zone. So I had to have that explained to me by my UN host, uh, Stan, you can go anywhere you want. I didn't know what the red pass meant. And after that, they told me which meetings to go to. And what I found unusual there and un something that I didn't, um, couldn't imagine was the slow, meticulous uh, argument over sentences that essentially it was an editing process of uh, the statement that was going to come out. Um, and uh, the Paris Agreement requires each cop to make new promises to ratchet up the pressure and it was more than 50%, perhaps 
70 percent young women, by which I mean women in their 30s and 40s, very serious, very cheerful. They were lawyers. They were diplomats, maybe a couple scientists. And they were working over these sentences, which is a process that I'm quite familiar with from my own work. And I just loved it. Um, and then there would be like a maybe an old Brit who had been at Bretton Woods with a battered uh, briefcase and kind of a limp and um, ancient like I was. Uh, and to kind of mm, ballast or uh, provide some low-key ironic humor to these uh, serious discussions of, of sentence making. And I watched them for an hour argue about whether a data presentation should be in rows or columns. And because of my wife's work, I know that that can be serious, that the presentation of data can provide clarity or it can obscure things. So I, I was entertained. But when I talked to my UN hosts afterwards about that, they groaned and they said, that's why we're doomed. We're too slow. We're too slow. We're not going fast enough. And they, they had this horrible feeling that as admirable as, as the COP process might be, it's going slower than the crisis is. And that, that uh, yeah. after all, is, is the theme of your works uh, and, uh, and, and, and really powerfully so that um, as, as our great historian of the future, you are in fact describing uh, how slow it goes compared to uh, what's happening on the planet. And, and I think you introduced a, a concept uh, in, in another work uh, about a decade ago, uh, 2132, if I'm uh, correct, the dithering uh, oh, yeah. of, uh, of uh, this long process uh, that is arguing about sentences while the planet burns, uh, in a way. And I must say, my overwhelming uh, life experience in this, since I started uh, my career as an incoming first-day budding economist 50 years ago, uh, is that I've watched 50 years of discussion on this uh, where you're wondering, when do we get to the action? Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, that negotiation over words, which I thought you must have watched over and over again because it really is part of the cadence of uh, the Ministry for the Future, flying to meetings, hoping something's going to happen. Well, not quite yet, flying to the next meetings, and then real life at the same time taking its course as these seemingly endless meetings go on. Well, too, uh, I want to reassure our listeners who maybe haven't read the book that I cleverly, having written about scientific meetings in my Washington, D.C. trilogy, sometimes called Science in the Capital, sometimes called Green Earth when I uh, compressed it to one volume, a lot of meetings, and uh, it began to drive me crazy, and the novel kind of burst out of the doors and went outdoors, in this case, notes from meetings could suffice. I didn't have to dramatize these scenes. And I was finding all kinds of literary tricks to make ministry uh, faster and more entertaining and in the kind of play of forms so that what kind of um, genre will you be reading when you move from one chapter to the next over the 106 chapters? Well, you don't know till you start it. And if it is going to be a meeting, unless it's a crucial one, you just get the notes from somebody taking notes at the back. It's over very quickly. There's also dialogues. There are riddles. There are um, it narratives where an object talks to you about its life, et cetera, et cetera. The, the, and the eyewitness account, I guess that's the crucial innovation for me in literary terms in ministry is that I had a lot of anonymous people who were somehow at a, a crux moment where, where slow violence turned into fast violence or where something decisive happened. And these eyewitness accounts are not like dramatized scenes in fiction. They are faster, they're um, they cut to the chase. They make judgments uh, about the actor and history itself. Like, this is what it meant to me. This is what it meant to the world. I saw it myself. That I found a beautiful genre, very um, um, emotional, but also very fast. And, and uh, so that sense of propulsion, uh, I think, really helped this novel. I mean, it's long, but the chapters are short and a lot of stuff is happening. And I think that's uh, crucial to the feeling that you're talking about of history. Um, I like it that you talk about this as being historical. Science fiction is indeed a historical fiction, but the problem is 
um, if you set a novel five million years in the future, anything could be happening, and the historical link between now and then is disappeared on you. Um, if you set it five years in the future, you're doing a kind of a realism of the present, but with a trajectory to it. You're pushing one aspect or another that reveals your theory of history. Like this, this is why things are going to happen the way they are, and this is why the present feels the way it does. So ministry is definitely near future science fiction. I mean, I started essentially now and run it out three decades and try to imagine a kind of a best case scenario that you can still believe in. That was well, what I, I was thinking. Well, I thought that time horizon was indeed uh, superb. I, of course, I, you mentioned uh, even political changes, uh, say in India, that relate to the current uh, political scene, but within 10 years is a very plausible uh, switchover or uh, making those links to what we are holding right now. But far enough uh, ahead that you're, you're telling us something quite important of uh, how things uh, can unfold. And I, I would also uh, tell you that I first uh, read the book, as it were, uh, by listening to it on the, the audio book, because mm. this was uh, the, the, the COVID uh, period. So I was uh, home uh, and uh, taking long walks in the afternoon and listening. And it's a wonderful book to listen to. I, I must say, especially because there, there are short, quick chapters. Uh, as you say, lots of uh, uh, huge, uh, quick changes of venue, and it works very well uh, as a as a as a drama uh, played out on on an audiobook. Reading it also uh, is uh, is of course wonderful, but it gives a different feel to it. Yeah. Well, I, I, I've listened to uh, enough of the audiobook to think they did a wonderful job. All of the different voices, the different uh, accents of English. Um, it's it's um, a pleasure. And I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I, I love yeah. the fact that the, uh, as, as it were, the, the minister of the Ministry for the Future, that is the, the UN official, who's a wonderful character, Mary Murphy, mm -hmm. uh, has her Irish... Uh, accent and uh, and uh, has her wonderful character uh, in this and and uh, actually uh, shows agency something can be done and that's pretty uplifting for those of us uh, working uh, in this seemingly endlessly ponderous uh, negotiations of uh, 196 signatories and so forth but yeah. hearing hearing her voice Counts. Because of your experiences at the UN, I I wanted to ask you about this. The the COP system and the Paris Agreement um, is a consensus model where every nation has to sign off on the annual document that's put out at the end of the COP meeting. And uh, Zayd Al Rad Hussein was frustrated by this and saying that's an explanation for how slow it is. That the consensus model is unusual even in the UN, much less the rest of international diplomacy, and he was hoping for something more like majority rules or uh, something that might make the process be bolder and faster. And since you, you know, with the SDGs, I wonder what you thought of that. You know, uh, it uh, has cut both ways. Uh, the, the urgency should come not necessarily through the shortcut of a majority vote, but, but actually through the understanding of what we're really facing uh, more clearly. The fact that there is unanimity, if I think about it, uh, yes, of course it made things slower, but one example where it made things better was in the Paris process. Uh, in 2015, the small island states, which otherwise would be completely rolled over, uh, in the system, uh, absolutely held their ground in Paris and said, we need the 1.5 degrees Celsius limit in there because that's us going underwater mm -hmm. if you violate that. And many people scoffed and said, well, we're not going to achieve 1.5 degrees. It's not possible. And why put it in there? And the small island state said, there is no agreement without it. And it actually found its way in 
And while we're not going to hold to 1.5 degrees, at least uh, without an overshoot, almost surely, uh, the fact of the matter is it's played actually perhaps the most constructive role of some clarification of what we're really doing in all of this, of anything that I've seen. And just in a nutshell, of course, the agreement says we should aim to keep well below two degrees Celsius, and no one quite knows what that means. Only diplomats would say that because it's not really a target. Uh, but they said well below two degrees. And then the small island states, because of this unanimity rule, were able to push the 1.5 degree. We should aim to stay below 1.5 degrees. Then the scientists came in soon after that in the intergovernmental panel. And they said, oh, 1.5 degrees, absolutely far more serious than anything else we could set. And you have to decarbonize by mid-century in order to be able to have a, a reasonable chance to hit that. And so suddenly we had at least a little bit of clarity about the what to do. Mm. And so thinking about it, you know, the holdouts, the holdouts in any rule you pick would be powerful countries, first of all, whether it's majority rule or not. If you don't have the U.S. and China yeah. and the European Union in there, you're not going to have any kind of meaningful agreement, period. Yeah. But maybe the unanimity rule, oddly enough, I never really thought about it uh, uh, so straightforwardly uh, until your question, enabled some of the otherwise nearly voiceless countries to have some voice but in the end, in the end, we come to something which I think is fundamental in, in your books, very accurate, very clear, very important, Stan, and I think you, you really nail it. The, the slowness is not actually these government negotiations or the UN. It is that we have a system uh, of... Uh, economics, we have uh, real power, we have big corporate power, we have lots of powerful interests, and the system's really a system. You know, it's yeah. not just there to be uh, altered because some diplomats say so. The diplomats are there because there are governments that are uh, really enthralled to powerful interests after all. And yes. I think the books make clear, to my mind, beautifully, that there's a, a deeper system at work. And it is slow. It is deeply locked into place. It is about money. It is about capitalism. It is about greed that that engenders. And the capacity of rich people who can easily know what's going on to not care about what's going on is a stunning feature. Those who are in control of the major enterprises that really could make a difference. Yes, I, I, I appreciate that, what you're saying. I am interested in um, trying to uh, suggest ways that we can make the system that we are in right now work faster to confront the, the mass extinction event that we're starting. So we have the nation state system, you know, Treaty of Westphalia, all that sovereignty. And we have global capitalism, the the kind of system of accumulation and extraction and exploitation of um, um, less powerful people by more powerful people. This this system, I've argued against it my whole career as an American leftist. And indeed, like in my Mars novels, I would present a different political economy. And this is what utopian novels do, made up from scratch, using earlier models, but having that that uh, almost hypothetical moment of we're, we're writing a new constitution here and we're making a new political economy. Let's make a better one. That's all very well. And it's... Um, interesting and fun, but that's not the situation that we're in now in the world. And so my own um, political preferences, such as they are, because I'm pretty labile in that regard, um, with a except for always pre um, preferring public over private, the commons over property, uh, and so on, just the usual leftist values, 
of egalitarianism, etc. So what? The system that we're in, we need to dodge a mass extinction event using it. So in ministry, I had to think about Keynesianism, about uh, Piketty-type tax structures, that there, there shouldn't, perhaps rich people should be taxed out of existence. Perhaps there should be a floor under which no human being can fall of security and adequacy. Um, that's, that's true. And then the biosphere as a citizen that has to be healthy for us to be healthy, um, using uh, the tools that we have now. Um, and Therefore, the central banks, fiat money, quantitative easing, the so-called carbon coin, which is a kind of a green quantitative easing, not dissimilar from this recent IRA bill, but uh, comprehensive. And um, these these are um, much less radical um, changes, uh, in, uh, innovations. That I, I was struggling to imagine what we could do in the system that we currently have. In that, the you know, the European Union, if you're a member state of something rather than a sovereign nation, that's a huge change psychologically and legally and fiscally. So uh, there were models there since we're all supposedly member states of the of the. Um, uh, Paris Agreement, for instance, of the UN, and and as you said, the big nations think they can do what they want. There's a there's a psychological set of sovereignty there that is a little bit um, unhelpful and exaggerated. Um, that it, the concept of a member state is good at making something more global, which is what we need now. So these were the kind of thoughts that went into the the crafting of the plot of Ministry for the Future, a, a little bit, um, I mean, you, a, a little bit desperate. I think you must know this feeling that you've got a system, you need to make a fix, you've got to use the tools you've got, and some improvisation a, and uh, is uh, required. Well, I, what I what I think is uh, compelling about uh, this book and, and uh, New York 2140, Stan, is uh, it, it's... Not a utopian novel, that's for sure. It's not a dystopian novel either. It, no. it is, it's a history of the future. It really is. And it shows how things can unfold at multiple levels. And that is also both fun, interesting, thought provoking, and, and a, a great read. And by that, I mean, there are the UN processes, there are the central bankers uh, there. But there are also individuals on the ground coping with an extreme heat wave. Uh, there are uh, mm -hmm. uh, desperate young people forming a terrorist cell uh, as uh, as the response to uh, the the dithering that's uh, going on. So they take uh, desperate action. There is uh, the uh, government of India saying we have to take this into our own hands. No one cares about us. We've had a massive die-off because of this. We're going to put sulfates into the atmosphere, do geoengineering. We don't have mm -hmm. to ask for anybody's uh, permission. What's, what's, what's accurate about this is that there is a, a background, deep dynamic, but then there's agency all over the place. Some of it... <laughs> perhaps horrendously wrong-headed or right-headed or uh, not exactly working the way people want, but people are trying to react and pushing in a variety of ways. And this is why it's not dystopian, because there actually are solutions, sometimes in the ground, from the ground up, literally, that spread. Sometimes a, a top-down breakthrough occurs, usually 20 years after uh, it should have. But I think that that's what makes this history, which is uh, it is an unfolding of, of a real complexity. And we're dealing with the complexity. Uh, we'd like the solution now. Uh, and by the way, you know, my experience is for uh, 15 years, I was heading an institute at... Uh, Columbia University, the Earth Institute, with hundreds of climate scientists. And damn it, if they didn't tell me every week, Jeff, it's worse than we thought. It's going faster than we thought. So if you're in the midst of that, you know how terrifying this is. And you see the contrast because 
I would spend uh, days then at the UN in these uh, parsing sentences uh, and trying to explain what I'm hearing from, from the scientific crowd. But you're capturing how things can unfold. And it's definitely not dystopian, though, obviously, uh, neither is it utopian. Well, I think of it as the, the utopia of our time, if you think of utopia as a name for a kind of history rather than an end state, and this is H.G. Wells's great innovation, that the utopia for our time is you dodge the mass extinction event and everything else you can repair later. But extinction is um, irrevocable and a catastrophe for future generations and for the biosphere itself, our, our extended body. So it's still a utopian novel, but it was very crucial that it started in the present and it and it was one that you could believe in, a, a kind of reality test that one puts to fiction at all points. Um, there is the willing suspension of disbelief. There is the ability to read fantasy novels. But when you're reading something like this, the the reality test is, could this really happen? And I wanted the novel to... Um, pass that test at every point along the way, even though at the end of it, 30 years on, they're in a much better situation than we are now. Um, and so I notice now that for any good thing that happens in the novel, something bad immediately follows in the next chapter. The mess of history, the chaotic nature of it, the fact that there's a lot of people who don't agree with um, our vision of what's going on in the world, don't agree that climate change is an existential threat and so on, um, that had to be um, acknowledged and become part of the story or else the story wouldn't be realistic enough. And I must say, the two years since this book came out have been the uh, astonishing to me, uh, bizarre and uh, unexpected for sure, and what it what it's taught me is people are desperate for a story like this. Any strange peccadilloes of this particular novel are irrelevant or because of the hunger for a story that we could scrape through. Now, the scientists are telling us that if we did indeed do everything right, we still are right on the inside edge of these planetary boundaries. So it's it's just barely possible that this is a... Uh, a story that can come true. Uh, so it's not a fantasy or um, or cruel optimism, I hope. But it, but you can't say for sure because you're talking about the future and it's changing very, very rapidly in front of us and we're co closing in on planetary boundaries that if we break them, we can't claw back even if we wanted to. Even if we devoted all of human civilization's effort to it, we can't bring, I don't know, the ocean back to health or various planetary boundaries. We can't stop the permafrost from melting and dumping a huge load of methane and carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, at which point we're, we're cooked even with geoengineering. So the moment is super dangerous and presenting a, a positive story. On the one hand, it has the dangers of creating complacency. Oh, we're going to scrape through. Let's not worry about it. On the other hand, if you don't have that story, then you're just caught in the world of dystopia and post-apocalyptic, uh, the imaginary of our time. Oh, we're doomed, so let's just party, a kind of Goethe Damerung. Well, uh, it I, was, I, yeah. You, you know, I, I think uh, while the, the books uh, New York 2140 came first uh, yes. or before uh, this one, uh, it, it chronologically, it follows this book. Uh, new, this book, uh, The Ministry for the Future, uh, takes us uh, to mid-century, basically, uh, and it gives the sense that by mid-century, after lots of very serious disasters and a, a lot of uh, global warming and climate change, there is at least a, 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 a budding new global uh, civilization that is coming to grips with this challenge. But one of the interesting uh, sidebars of, of uh, Ministry for the Future is this attempt to pump water uh, in Antarctica from under uh, one of the uh, ice sheets to prevent it from creating uh, the disaster of sea level rise. Uh, I can tell you for the last 15 years, my lead climate guru, my close colleague and a a genius and a wonderful person, James Hansen, uh, mm. has been telling me in advance of IPCC and others by many years 
how dangerous the Antarctic situation is and how we are basically committed to multimeter sea level rise, but over what time span, hard to know. But this overshoot of carbon in the atmosphere is uh, likely to have devastating effects unless we not only stabilize, but really uh, reduce the atmospheric concentrations of CO2. Yes. So a point that I would make, even a, a scientific point, is your modest optimism that 30 years or so of uh, somewhat more dithering and some terrorism and upheavals and some disasters, uh, the world could get around to a new political economy, uh, isn't inconsistent with the fact that by then, we could actually lose a significant piece of uh, West Antarctic ice sheet uh, to later in uh, later in the century or on some time scale like that. Yes. And it's notable. I want to turn to New York 2140. Uh, Good. <laughs> I, I often say, by the way, in speeches around the world that I, too, live on a small island economy because I am a Manhattanite uh, and uh, yeah. We are a small island economy, uh, an unusual one. Uh, and this remarkable uh, novel, uh, New York 2140, uh, takes place after what you call the, the two giant pulses uh, that uh, end up creating. Well, why don't you why don't you describe it? Well, I will. And it, it's fun because it comes out of a James Hansen paper. He was the first of about 18 co-authors from a variety of different scientific disciplines because it's very hard to determine where sea level was in the past because the, the lithosphere itself is moving up as, and down as well as the hydrosphere moving up and down. And so it's highly speculative. And this paper was contested by other people. It's a controversial one. But for me, wanting Manhattan to be half underwater, wanting as a thought experiment to describe a world where Manhattan's a kind of a Venice, at least lower Manhattan, because of a 50-foot rise in sea level by the near future. And the reason it's out in 2140 is that's as near as I could make it seem plausible. That Hansen Pacer paper was hugely encouraging to me, despite its controversial nature, because once in the Emian, he, he and his uh, colleagues claim so 130,000 years ago or so, there was um, a sea level rise of about 30 feet in one century. And this is just radically fast. And they tried to explain it. And that's where he came up with this uh, phrase, the Antarctic explanation, the ice down there. There's a buttress to the buttress. Um, the, it, the, under the West Antarctic ice sheet is a kind of a bowl where it's shallower near the edge of the ice sheet uh, in the ocean than it is further inland where it's actually, the ground is deeper there, the ice is deeper. The implication is a lot of ice could come off, go out into the ocean, melt very quickly and raise sea level. And we're very close to that. So um, my those two novels don't describe the same future history. I, I never like to do that. These are different futures, but in the New York novel, I have them failing in the in Ministry for the Future. I have them actually attempting to cope with that because some glaciologists think that we could possibly slow the glaciers back down to their historic speed and avoid this uh, s relatively quick and certainly catastrophic sea level rise. Because if it does rise that much, we've lost all the beaches automatically because they're at sea level, but then also all the seaports, all the coastal cities. I've heard estimates of 10 to 20 percent of humanity. Um, so, uh, and, uh, and many of the great cities of the world are right there at sea level. So, could we pin those glaciers back down by freezing them back to the bottom? Well, I want to actually, I want to write about this again in a nonfiction book about Antarctica. I've been down there twice. I have stories to tell. But in the New York book, it hasn't worked. The two big pulses have meant that lower Manhattan is underwater. But also, and I know you will appreciate this being a Manhattanite, the intertidal zone, the New York Bay, I think the high, difference between high tide and low tide is 10 or 12 feet. And it, it, if... 
sea level were 50 feet higher, there would be many blocks, like maybe 10 to 20 blocks of Midtown or lower, uh, whatever, in the 30s in terms of the avenues that would be, of the streets, I mean, that would be underwater at high tide, but exposed to the land at low tide. And then you get into very weird um, property laws because of the old Roman law that the intertidal cannot be owned. So there I had my games. I could make fun of finance. I could make fun of the the tendency for finance to want to make money off of anything, including exactly. catastrophe. So I had a great game to play there. And I would, I mean, I, New York 2140 is a lot more uh, was more fun to write. I think it's more fun to read. It's it's a comedy of coping. It doesn't have the kind of grim um, edge of uh, breakdown that ministry has to cope with. It's simply a different kind of novel. Um, and I found it, yeah. uh, yes, uh, very uh, well. Great, great fun to read, especially since I'm in the Upper West Side. Uh, at least we, 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 we stay above uh, the, the uh, flood zone. And I remember, by the way, uh, I mean, of course I remember vividly a decade ago with our Superstorm Sandy, which was a devastation and created uh, massive loss of life and, uh, and uh, around $60 billion of damage in, in one day. My wife and I were walking around the Upper West Side feeling, eh, seems to be a little bit exaggerated, but on the... Uh, yeah. lower part of Manhattan, of course, it was uh, utter devastation that we didn't know about until uh, until the next morning. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you you tell that uh, story uh, in, incredibly. Uh, I'll, and I'll never forget with Superstorm Sandy, one of my very esteemed colleagues at uh, the Earth Institute was saying for years and years and years, we're going to have massive flooding here. We're going to have massive flooding here. The city wasn't paying any attention. State wasn't paying any attention. The uh, 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 Army Corps of Engineers, no attention. Uh, and then this colleague's house was caught in the floods uh, in disaster, which I found so sad and, and ironic because he was the one that had nailed even to which subway stations were going to be the ones to be buried buried by the flood. Yeah. But I, I realized, uh, again, this is a book that has a lot of fascinating agency to it and a lot of uh, similar politics, actually, uh, a system that is a pretty deep system, like you say, how do you make money off of every disaster, which incidentally, uh, you know, is hilarious uh, in the way you tell it, but it also struck me, it, it reminded me of uh, an event that I went to where a hedge fund uh, manager, very rich, successful hedge fund manager, uh, in, to a big crowd, described his past year of uh, each event and then how he reacted to it in the market. Uh -huh. And I remember every event because I'm involved with public policy uh, on almost everything. And I realized I missed the instinct. Every single terrible event, he thought, well, does that mean I should short the kroner or long the yen? And I never had that impression even once during the year. I was saying, oh, my God, what do we do about a geopolitical crisis? How can we stop a war? How are we going to save these people? But yeah. the hedge funds really are trained in a, in a completely crazy way. Yeah. What yeah. is the market play from all of this? Yes, exactly. And they're, they've abstracted out of the world in a way that you have not the a reality that money means nothing if civilization has crashed. If the biosphere has crashed, you can't cash in. It will be pointless. So they need to uh, be thinking differently. Uh, I had great education for New York 2140 a group at UC Santa Cruz and at New York University, Randy Martin, um, the financialization of daily life. These were my teachers for uh, the finance approach to life. And then The Big Short, that's a wonderful book by um, uh, Michael Lewis, I think, describing the the um, the mentality of, of, of finance, uh, of financialization as being a kind of parasite on the real economy and also on the real biosphere. And so that has a kind of a, 
a black comedy to it. Uh, how can we make money off this? But also my financier in the book, uh, Franklin Gar, he learns to think differently. He He's probably the character that changes the most in having a kind of a, an epiphany or a satori on the Hudson River up there near the cloisters. And parenthetically... Yeah, try, try, I, trying, <laughs> trying to get the girl, after all. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but he had but to it, it impress changes her. his mind, exactly. Yes, and, and real uh, the real economy, that, that investment could... If you went long on reality <laughs> and on human uh, welfare in the future, then you would have to invest in different things. And, and what I'm seeing, what I saw at Glasgow, was what they're calling risk-adjusted investment. That means the risk adjustment is taking reality into account, taking the climate change into account. And now risk adjusted investment, the, the, the group that Mark Carney assembled at Glasgow to uh, promise to use their assets for green work. And that was one hundred and thirty trillion dollars worth of asset, a fairly significant portion of the world's private assets. That was a good sign. It doesn't matter if there are some broken promises there, that there's some greenwashing in it. That does not matter. The fact that private capital is now risk adjusting um, is right. well, one at of least, Yeah, we have to take this into account at least, uh, yeah. if, if only to understand uh, how future assets uh, might respond to future events. And you can see the political fight against it, that uh, the uh, ESGs, the, the, um, these being risk adjusted is politically volatile and controversial because some people are committed to the Goethe Dammerung. In other words, if we have to change or the world goes down, the world is going down because we're not going to change. So that political battle is is being clarified for us and it might lead to – um, further progress. Uh, some of the things I've learned since I uh, wrote Ministry, which was 2019, have made me more encouraged rather than less encouraged. I think a better future than the one in Ministry is actually possible now. And this is because Trump lost. This is because Bolsonaro lost. Um, and the the Network for Greening the Financial System, this co consortium or, or study group of the big central banks, I didn't even know about it. And they are working on a carbon coin equivalent. Um, these were th – this was news to me. And what I realized is you cannot keep up – and actually, even from your position – you can't keep up with the present. Things are changing too fast. There's too much to know. You can't possibly know it all. One individual has to have a filtering system, and you accidentally filter out um, sometimes excellent news that is extremely uh, – that can give you reasons for hope or projects to pursue. Um, this glacier project, I thought it was one glaciologist's crazy idea. I was willing to run with it. Actually, it's a fairly well-developed plan amongst a whole group of glaciologists, and it's still highly speculative, but it's, you know, it's worth pursuing. It might work, et cetera, et cetera. It, uh, it would be a kind of military operation, but we need the military doing useful things. So I've, I've had a, a mixed uh, couple of years, but a, quite an education. I, I thought one interesting point uh, in both books, uh, I think you use the same uh, expression, riot strike riot. Uh, oh, yeah. As uh, uh, a little bit of uh, the fact that things won't just sit still for big power necessarily. Yeah. Uh, w w one of the events in New York 2140, without uh, going into all the plot details, is uh, that there's a mass social reaction. Not oh, yes. surprisingly, after the city basically is disappearing underwater. Yes, yeah, so that's my friend, uh, Joshua Clover. That's the name of his book, Riot Strike Riot. And um, he's my friend and teacher here in Davis. Ah, and I want to okay. say he's he's part of a discussion, it includes Andreas Malm, How to Blow Up a Pipeline, or Erica Chenoweth. Oh, my God. Well, somebody knew how to blow up a pipeline. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, it's I, a... <laughs> I, I have my suspicions, too, and I'm not too happy about it, I have to say. Well, um, that book is, he's, is really, um, it's not a technical manual for saboteurs. It's a, it's a, it's a attempting to make a distinction between sabotage and murder. And what is civil resistance? And so why civil resistance works by Erica Chenoweth. That's another important uh -huh. uh, book on these topics. What do you do? And w especially for the New York novel, I was very involved in the idea that the public, 
can bring down the financial system by a targeted non-payment of their debts, uh, student debt, mortgages, rents. If you, if ever, on Fourth of July of 2024, everybody didn't pay, then the banks would fold. And I thought, in when I wrote the New York novel, which is more like I don't know, 2015, 2016, that if we nationalized the banks the private banks, like we nationalized GM in 2008, that that would solve all problems. Now, this was overly simplistic. I learned things since then that made me think that, that there is no total solution, and that would be interesting, but it wouldn't solve all our problems. But it would be uh, interesting, and that the public could um, make it happen by a targeted fiscal action. This was news to me. And so the plot of New York 20 and 40, I was just very excited. Like, oh my gosh, there can be effective public action beyond just voting. We can um, bring the system down and then have a government in power that would take it back over so there would be more public power over private uh, capital. Well, I don't know if we even need that, but... It's interesting to think... Uh, I, it, it may go back in some way to Leviticus, uh, to the Jubilee... Uh, which is uh, the idea of a fresh start. And, and uh, yes. uh, I, I think that uh, there could be some merit in that. I wanted to ask you about one of the uh, epigraphs of uh, the many wonderful epigraphs uh, in uh, New York 2140. Uh, you quote Picasso. Uh, I thought a wonderful uh, quotation. Art is not truth. Art is a lie that enables us to realize the truth. I felt that was speaking about your, your, uh, mm -hmm. your books. Uh, they're not lies, but uh, they are helping us to realize the truth. Well, thank you. They are long, complicated lies. That's what somebody told me novels were. That's why they only read nonfiction. And I thought, well, I don't know why that doesn't ring right. But Picasso clarified that. <laughs> it's, a, it's a wonderful quotation, and I think it fits well. And to say that uh, I, I think uh, it, it, these are not complicated lies, they, they really are helping us to see the truth. Uh, you know, we discussed it briefly, uh, and uh, we're all going to learn about it. The Ministry for the Future is soon to be followed by the Summit of the Future of, of the UN uh, in 2024. I can't help thinking your book had something to do with that, although I don't know that, uh, yes or no, but uh, it certainly could have and, uh, and, and may have. Uh, so we're going to have a, a world summit for the first time. Yes. to talk about the future explicitly. Just uh, love, your, love your closing thoughts on that. Well, uh, some insider friends in the UN have told me that indeed Ministry for the Future had, a, had a, a, an effect on this decision. I'm very, very pleased. Well, congratulations. Um, again, yeah, astounded. And I, I think I will be invited to take part in it as a, a kind of a, a court jester um, figure, um, which is great. Uh, and I, I, I'm hoping that you'll be there. What I want, I'm planning. What I want, uh, I, I'm reading. I've read, um, you know, the the ages of globalization and uh, a new foreign policy. Your two most recent books. And what I'm hungry for from you and uh, the economists uh, at your level uh, is precisely some kind of um, neo-Keynesian Thomas Piketty. Um, Political economy, uh, the the political economy for our time, the 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 set of laws, mechanisms, guardrails, procedures, regulations, um, coherently laid out for the world to use as tools going forward. Uh, because I think it's missing. I I've been looking. I haven't found it. I think it's hard. I've, I looked into modern monetary theory. Very interesting, a kind of neo-Keynesianism. You've got to, we've got to get past the neoliberal, um, the market rules, the state facilitates the market. That's not going to uh, cut it. Absolutely. We, uh, we need a return. And I've often used the analogy of World War II, where the Allied governments in particular took over the economy. The the British government said to the Bank of England, you're now just part of the Treasury. We're going to tell you what to do. We're in an emergency, and therefore um, uh, the highest rate of return, quarterly profit, shareholder value, these are terrible rubrics if you're trying to save the biosphere. We need a different set of rubrics and a, and a different – 
uh, an advanced set of rules based on what we've got now. You can't just go theoretical and make up Plato's Republic or whatever. You have to actually have, and and you've been doing that, so you're already in the groove. And but to make it, um, maybe I I mean, that's am I very right? interesting. I'll, I'll tell you. Last week we yeah. had a, uh, a a meeting at the Vatican, uh, actually of uh, a, a wide range of uh, thinkers on the theme that we need new economic institutions, which is what you're referring to, and what you implicitly and explicitly write about, new economic ethics as well. We need to think about what we're doing in a different way. Uh, actually, the market system is based on an ethical system. It's yeah. often not made very explicit. It's a little weird. Uh, it came out of, uh, out of England, really. It's a, it's a British empiricist ethics from the 16th to the 18th centuries. And it gets a, a lot weird and a lot wrong. Mm -hmm. And we definitely need something, uh, something new uh, and something better. So uh, as, as you write, you're, you're next. I'm, I'm trying to write a, a principles textbook based on uh, those uh, themes. Uh, so I'm working on, on that myself right now. So we have uh, a lot we can uh, chat about uh, in, in that. Well, I hope to come to New York for these uh, for this uh, summit of the future, and maybe we can meet there. But I'm very glad to hear you say that. And this is and what you say chimes with this. Um, uh, ec economics is a powerful social science, but if you think about it as a kind of a, a geometry that has axioms and it has theorems, that the axioms have to be reexamined from scratch because that's what you're talking about. Ethics. These are not physical properties these are social properties that we make up ourselves so if absolutely that, you solve for a different equation by changing the axioms okay we want no humans uh, suffering we want the biosphere healthy solve for that as a political economy so Stan, it's a, yeah. you're exactly uh, uh, exactly on point uh, this will be our next discussion uh, Great. which I will hugely <laughs> enjoy. Uh, once again, thank you so much uh, for being together for this discussion, uh, the Ministry of the Future, New York 2140, and all your uh, wonderful uh, writings uh, on uh, these and other subjects. Uh, they're uh, an absolute joy and a, and a gift for the world, so we're most grateful uh, and uh, so much fun to be with you. Uh, thank you for joining Book Club with Jeffrey Sachs, and uh, it's been an absolute delight, Stan, to, to be together with you today. Thanks so much. Well, thank you, Jeff, and thanks for your work, and uh, I look forward to seeing more of it.